Hello, Pastor Tracy here. I'm the assistant pastor here at Calvary Chapel Eastside, and we just want to thank you for streaming this uh, teaching today. We hope that it encourages you, that it builds you up, but most importantly, that it challenges you in your walk with Jesus Christ. Now, we just want to say that we offer these teachings online as an additional resource, in addition to your personal Bible study time and your time at a local church. See, we believe that being a part of a local church is key to your growth, and we believe that it is mandated in God's Word for us to be a part of a local body. So please, be involved in a local body, support a local church. That's very important. Now, If you are not a part of a local church, we would love to invite you to come and be a part of what goes on here at Calvary Chapel Eastside. You can look on our website at cceschurch.com. It'll give you all of the information that you need to know, our background, our service times, and where our location is at. We would love to have you come and join with us, but until then, God bless you, and may God bless you richly. 1 Peter chapter 1. See what God has for us today. There's this great fisherman speaks... Thank you, Wendy. Speaks to us uh, today. When Jesus began his public ministry, he was about 30 years of age, Scripture tells us, in Luke, and he eventually wound up collecting to himself about 12 guys that uh, he called disciples. We call apostles, as later they were sent out by the Lord. Simon Peters was one of those guys, formerly a commercial fisherman, kind of a blue-collar trade in that day and age. It didn't require any education at all. Well, they walked in the footsteps of their father, who had been a fisherman, and the sons of Zebedee, whose father was a commercial fisherman as well. And they knew each other as they fished from the northern shores of the Lake of Galilee in Israel uh, for their livelihood. And apparently they were quite successful at it. So when Jesus said to Peter, come, Peter, and I will make you a fisher of men, that meant a lot to Peter, who turned his back on the nets and never went back. Uh, This letter was written in the 13th year of Nero, the uh, church historian Eusebius tells us, which would put it in the year 67 AD. That's important because in in the winter of 67, 68 AD, Nero put both Peter and Paul to death. So as we uh, approach our winter solstice here, uh, December 21st, and embark into the full, first full-fledged day of winter. Then we remember that many that have gone on before us uh, in the early church that celebrated the birth of Christ in that winter in Bethlehem's manger, uh, we walk in their footsteps. He, they lost their lives in winter, and so I think it's appropriate that we remember those guys too uh, who lost their lives. And many that have done so since, they had... Nero had blamed the burning of Rome on Christians, and there was a merciless persecution like nobody had ever seen before against those first century Christians. And we have it so easy in America. We are so blessed. I, we have never known persecution. We've never been whipped, beaten, and jailed for our faith. We're free to gather together in open assembly. We're free to study the Word of God. Uh, we're free to put that out over the airwaves. And for those of you joining us online, welcome. In Jesus' name, we love having you a part of our family. Uh, All of this is possible because Jesus Christ, in his first coming, touched the lives of so many people. You think about that. Uh, This humble Galilean carpenter has touched how many billions of lives since his coming in Bethlehem's manger? How many lives? Uh, And yet he never wrote a book, but the book we hold in our hands is all about him. He never traveled more than 90 miles from his home, and yet he is known today around the world. He is more important to us and more powerful to us uh, than all of the wars ever fought, the ships ever built, armies ever put together. He is central and foremost above all of them, King of kings, Lord of lords, and he is coming again. He is coming again, and it should order our priorities today. That's what Peter tells us in this epistle. He tells us basically in a nutshell of what, especially here in these op- this opening chapter, uh, the first half of it is what God has done for us. The second part of it is how should we respond to him? Not with apathy, 
There are many apathetic Christians in the world today, half-hearted followers that claim the name of Christ but don't act particularly Christian in their conduct, don't cling to him vigorously, don't stand on the promises of God, study the words, sing his praises, or listen to Christian radio or TV. They are nominal Christians. They're, they are numberless today out there. There's so many of them. But Peter's encouragement is don't be like that. Be different, be spirit-filled, be on fire, be studiers of the word, be devoted followers of Christ, not caught up in the weirdness that's out there that has historically divided the church, silly theological arguments that people to the present day argue about. The issue is Jesus. The book is about Jesus from Genesis to Revelation. It's about Jesus. When people ask you about dinosaurs, you tell them, I don't know nothing about dinosaurs, but let me tell you about Jesus. You don't have to be a scholar, a nuclear physicist to understand these things. Or, or when they ask you, well, how did Noah get all those animals on here? I don't know nothing about Noah and those animals or how God did it, but I know about Jesus. Amen. Let me tell you about Jesus. So the whole book, and especially at Christmas time, it's important for us to remember. Uh, he is the, the linchpin upon all of which history turns. There has never been a more important figure in history, in the history of the world, than Jesus Christ. No one has touched more lives. Nobody has had more books written about him, more people writing theological treatises and commentaries about him than all other religious figures put together. And these men died for their faith. I pray that you and I might never be put to the test if we were willing to do that. It's easy to say that we would be willing to do so, but no, no executioner's axe has ever hung over our heads. These guys paid the price for their faith in Christ Jesus. You know why? Because they knew they weren't dying for a lie. They weren't dying for some man-made theology. They weren't dying for religion. They were willing to die because they had been with the Son of God. They had, they had witnessed his death and burial and resurrection. They knew he was alive. They saw him ascend into heaven, and they were willing to give their lives to stand on those facts. Our faith in Christianity is not based upon faith per se. It's based upon what Jesus already did. Our faith is simply in response to what we acknowledge is historical reality, verifiable truth and factual evidence. If you have an objective bone in your body, you must believe that Jesus Christ came. He's alluded to by Roman sources, Jewish sources, and Christian sources throughout the early four centuries of the early church's existence. If you're willing to throw away that body of evidence, then you must not believe anything that happened before you were born. You accept all of these other things. Do you believe that George Washington was our first president? Were you there? Why do you believe it? Because people who were there wrote eyewitness testimonies about it, and we have that written legacy for us today. The Bible is no different there is more manuscript evidence for the veracity of the New Testament scriptures than any other piece of antiquity. Do you believe Romeo and Juliet was written by Shakespeare? Do you, do you know that we have no original manuscripts of that whatsoever? Nobody challenges that. Have you read the histories of, of Thucydides? We do not have any original copies of that. The writings of the ancient Greek historian Herodotus, we read his writings and, and teach it in college classes. We have no original manuscript evidence for his philosophies at all. And yet unquestioningly, we accept all of that and then question the veracity of the Word of God that was written down by eyewitnesses. We know exactly what the original language says. Nobody is in dispute of that. If you'd like to learn Greek, you can read it for yourself. It's not that hard to learn Greek. They did. <laughs> Peter knew it. And his use of the Greek language is exquisite. And the Greek, Koine Greek, understand, is the most articulate language that that mankind has ever invented. Never, including English, including American, which is not, by the way, English. Ask an English lady, Wendy's sitting on the front, she'll tell you, you guys don't speak English. <laughs> you speak some mongrel language, but that's not English. We speak a mongrel language made up of French and German and Latin and Greek and a variety of other languages that have had influence. 
<clears throat> but the Koine Greek that your New Testament was written in is historically verifiable. We know what the text says. And Koine Greek has linguistic devices that color and shade the meaning of its words, especially its verbs, like no language ever invented by mankind. So he, Peter is articulate. He was a commercial fisherman. He had to know the commercial language of his time, which was Koine Greek. Alexander the Great, 300 years before Christ, had spread knowledge of the language from the British Isles all the way over to India. Every person spoke and read Greek. No wonder God transmitted his New Testament in Koine Greek, the most articulate language that there has ever been. Peter becomes so foundational to the the early church, his name is mentioned 210 times in the New Testament, more than the Apostle Paul, whose name is only mentioned 162 times, and more than all of the others put together, which is only 142 times. Peter stands head and shoulders above them all, mostly because of what he did, who he was, and who Jesus knew he would become. That's the same way God puts his, Im his imprint upon you and I. It's not who we were that matters. We were all sinful people saved by grace. Amen? You know, it's not a sinathon. So when we share our faith, don't dwell on what a bad sinner you were. We all fell short the glory of God. It gives him no glory to tell what a dirtbag you were. It gives him glory when you tell people how transformed you were from your former way of life to who you are in Christ Jesus today. That's the basis of Paul writing this letter. He wants us to know how grateful we should be for all that God has done. So picking it up in verse 3, the text says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He knows what Jesus did for him. Amen. You remember that, uh, that one encounter of Jesus where Jesus said, you know, Peter, I tell you, I just want to borrow your boat, dude, so I'm going to crawl inside, push it off, and I'm going to preach to the crowds. And your voice carries over still water for a long ways. It's a perfect natural amphitheater kind of effect uh, that is there. And he preached to the crowds while Peter is in his boat. Peter's listening to every word. Later on, Jesus met the fisherman again and said, yo, catch any fish? The one question, a fisherman who has caught nothing hates to hear, to admit I'm a failure. I'm a, Peter, a commercial fisherman, fished all night, caught what? He didn't catch a minnow. He caught nothing but seaweed and the dirt and grunge off the bottom. He caught nothing. Jesus asked me, catch any fish? No. Well, push down out into deeper water, throw your net out on this side of the boat, Peter. And Peter's thinking to himself, I'm the commercial fisherman here. I, what are you? You're a carpenter? What do you know about fishing? Nothing. But because he had already sampled some of Jesus before, he said, nevertheless, Lord, at your command, I'll do it. And you remember there was such a huge catch of fish, the nets began to tear. They couldn't even haul him to the boats. The boats began to sink. Never in his whole life had Peter seen such a catch of fish. You willing to give it all up, Peter? The most successful commercial catch of fish that you've ever seen in your life worth in that day and age, what would be today, millions of dollars? Come and follow me. I'll make you a fisher of men. That's what Jesus says to you and I tonight. Come. I'll make you a fisher of men. doesn't matter whether you're a tax collector, a religious zealot, or any of the other uh, former lines of work of Jesus' apostles. He wants to take each one of us right where we're at and use this for his glory in ways I don't pretend to understand. I certainly don't deserve. I am eternally grateful for that he is an amazing, an amazing changed individual so he can't, even, he can't even go three verses without saying, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord, Jesus Christ. Let's praise him. Verse 3, in his view, in his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. 
For you English majors, you will recognize this as a run-on sentence which in the Greek, by the way, does not violate any rules of their grammar. It may not flow like that in the American, but who cares? It was written in Greek, not American. So what Peter says is, I want you to consider this whole thought and understand this gives you all the reason you need to praise Jesus Christ forever and ever and ever. So consider this whole thought. That's why run-on sentences went on the way they did in the original language. In the opening chapter of Ephesians, Paul goes on writing 214 words in a single sentence to those guys. That's the mother of all run-on sentences, but perfectly acceptable in Greek because when he forms it that way, you've got to consider the whole thing before you start looking at the individual bits. That's the beauty of that language which contains linguistic devices we have never had in the English language. He says in verse 3, in his great mercy... Do you know what the difference between mercy and justice? Mercy and justice and grace are all related concepts. But let me explain to you the difference because he uses a very particular word here for mercy. Justice. What's justice? Justice is getting what you deserve. Now, from a spiritual standpoint, you don't want justice. You don't want what your sins and mine deserve. You don't want that. Whatever your understanding of justice is, it's fair. We want justice for other people, but we don't want justice for ourselves. We want what? We want mercy. We want mercy. Justice is getting what you deserve. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. I pray for mercy all the time. I have never in my life prayed for justice for me. I know what I deserve. And praise God, Jesus paid the price for that. What I'm praying for is mercy. Lord, mercy, 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 pour it out. Just pour it out. What's the difference then between justice and mercy? What's grace? Justice is getting what you deserve. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. Yes, Lord. What's grace? Grace is getting what you never deserved. And that's the inheritance that he's talking about here. What does that inheritance in, in, involve? In his great mercy, he says, he has given us a new birth, a spiritual birth. Not we were born again. Nicodemus was so confused on that. Well, Jesus, I don't understand. This learned rabbi was such a fool. He said, Jesus, I don't understand how a full-grown six-foot man can crawl back into his mother's womb to be born again. And Jesus said, you, you're a teacher of Israel? And you don't understand these things? What kind of ninny booper are you? You know, I mean, that was a humbling moment for Nicodemus. And so Jesus explained to him, he was talking about a spiritual rebirth. Just as we were born physically, we need to be reborn spiritually. That happens the moment we confess our sins to Jesus Christ, acknowledging him as the Son of God, Savior of the world, Messiah, believing that he lived, that he died, was buried and rose on the third day. You ask him to forgive your sins, and he does. That is the new birth experience in a nutshell. It's just total surrender of your life to him. It's not complicated, but you've got to get past your ego. You've got to get past your religious self, thinking that you can save yourself if you go to enough dull church services and sit through some guy swinging a pot down the aisle with smelly smoke coming out of it, dressed in $1,000 robes. It's about Jesus. In his great mercy, he's given us new birth into a living hope. That's the result. I now have hope. If there is one need in the world today, it's hope. Why do the riots take place the way they do all around the world? And the 374 of them we saw last summer in America alone, where did the riots come from? They have no hope. They have no knowledge of the truth. They've not been set free from their sins. They're acting according to their old nature which is always going to express itself in rage and anger, all of the deeds of the flesh that Galatians 5 talks about. We have hope now through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Think about that. I have no fear of death because he rose from the dead. He conquered death for me. Death holds no fear for me or you as the Christian that believe in him. If I were to die in the middle of the next sentence, I'm going to wake up in heaven with Jesus. I'm good. What do you do with the corpse? Who cares? 
Bury it in the backyard. I'm, even if the foxes don't get to it, but that's all. I don't care. You know, that's like, that's like when you're at, at Thanksgiving. My wife loves to buy bags of mixed nuts, and we get the nutcrackers out, and we crack the nuts. The kids love to do that. They love making a mess, but they don't ever eat the nuts inside. But the, to the average person that knows what they're doing, when you crack them open, what do you do with the shell? Throw it away, because that's not the important part. So when this shell perishes, who cares what you do with it? The nut has gone to heaven. <laughs> I mean, you don't want to push the metaphor too far. I'm not saying I'm a nut, but some would disagree with that as well. What happens to the body? I have, verse 4, I have an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Where is it kept? What's it say? It's not on earth. It's kept in heaven for you in verse 4. Kept in heaven. There are theologians out there today and pastors that teach health, wealth, and prosperity is your appointed destiny here on earth. That's not what this says. It says your inheritance is kept where? You want to highlight that one. Kept in heaven for you. Don't expect your eternal reward on earth. Don't be looking for you to win the, the lottery down here. That In all probability, that won't happen. Your chances of getting hit by lightning are far better than you winning the big one. That's where you can't put your hope there, your trust, your confidence in that. In mercy, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Verse 4 begs the question, what, what, what is our inheritance? What, what lies ahead for us? What do we inherit from God? Well, Romans 8, 17 says that we are joint heirs with Christ. What does Christ own? Everything in this universe. I get to be a part of that inheritance? Boy, that outstrips the lottery nine ways to the middle. I'll take this all day long, an eternal, glorious inheritance is mine in Christ Jesus because we're joint heirs with Christ. It says in that same passage that we are going to share in his glory. Share in his glory. Oh, my. It says also that we will rule and reign with him. 2 Timothy chapter 2, Revelation 20. Uh, we're, we're asked the question by Paul in 1 Corinthians 6. Don't you know that the saints will judge the world? That's part of ruling and reigning with Christ when he sets up his kingdom on this planet for a thousand years. You and I will be ruling and reigning with him. Have you ever watched the news and say, why isn't there justice anymore in the world? Well, you get to be the judge in the millennial kingdom. Bad guys get to go to jail. And you can lock them up for a long time and throw away the key. I mean, do what's right according to God's word. There's also room for grace and mercy in the exercise of justice. But then we'll have the heart and mind of Christ. When we do that, it will be a perfect and glorious world. When he reigns over this earth, we rule and reign with him for a thousand years. It says also in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we will judge the angels. How many of you feel up to that task? You want to tell Gabriel and Michael who, how the cow ate the cabbage? Really? No, 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 no. You won't be judging the good angels. They haven't sinned. The fallen angels, the demons, have. We will be judging them, according to God's word, for their rebellion and apostasy. And we will do it with the heart and mind of Christ. Revelation 2 says that we will be given authority over the nations. Who knows? You may be the president of the United States in the millennial kingdom. Ooh. Ah. What, what do I want to be president of? Maybe small, some small Hawaiian island with a hammock and palm trees and coconuts growing and listening to the surf coming in while I play my ukulele. I could rule over that all day long. All day long. There's an island right next to mine with your name on it, Dwayne. <laughs> Given authority over the nations. It says that we will sit with Jesus on his throne in Revelation 3, 21. But notice again, look carefully at this, highlight it if you got one. If you don't, nudge your neighbor and say, can I borrow your highlighter a second? And if you didn't bring a highlighter, know this, you are in sin. It's a venial sin. It's not a mortal sin. You can be forgiven. I'll pray for you to get out of purgatory. Uh, and uh, you can, uh, kept in heaven for you. Don't look for your reward on earth. That's the mistake. Because we're earthbound, we tend to think just like the world does. 
The world clamors after riches and gold and wealth and power and prestige and get their name in the papers and their photograph with X, Y, or Z celebrity. They, uh, these things don't mean a hill of beans to Jesus. Ooh, I, I went to so-and-so and I saw this Hollywood star. Who cares? One time I actually had that happen. I, I, I took my wife to Laguna Beach one time and we were in, when I was going to seminary out in California and we went down there for, in this little breakfast joint and Cloris Leachman was sitting at the table next to us and Kathy nudged me and goes, there's Cloris Leachman. I go, oh, whatever. And I, uh, I'm just enjoying my breakfast. I don't care who's in the restaurant. And a couple of years, two years later, she was dead. She didn't know Jesus. Doesn't matter how successful you are in this world. Do you know who the founder of Microsoft was along with Bill Gates? No? Paul Allen. One of the richest men on the whole planet. Steve, Steve Jobs was help, helped with the foundation of Apple. Um, but but uh, Paul Allen uh, was just as rich and as, as famous and as wealthy as, as Bill Gates, but kept a real behind-the-scenes privacy going on. Uh, he didn't know Jesus. He was so wealthy, he kept his own private World War II Air Force in a private airfield of his and hired enough people to keep all of those 80-year-old airplanes actually flying. He kept them all in perfect flying condition. They were in perfect condition. Billionaires can do these sorts of things. He was not a pilot himself. He couldn't have taken off in any one of them, but he liked having them in his prestige garage. Owned more cars than you and I have owned, all of us put together in a lifetime. Lived in mansions, had houses all over the world. And God one time laid on my heart <coughs> and, and said, I want you to write him a letter and tell him he needs Jesus. Try to find his address. Try to find his address. This guy is buried so far underground. Well, God allowed me to actually come up with his address outside of Seattle, Washington, uh, on this private uh, refuge of his. And I, I wrote him a letter telling him all about Jesus. I got no response from the letter. It may have never made it to him, but I pray that it did. And two years later, he was dead. And to this present day, his children and all of his business associates are still going through lawsuits to see who gets his billions upon billions upon billions of dollars. Can I tell you where he is at today? His wealth wasn't taken with him. What hope did he have? He wasn't saved. I pray that somewhere, somehow, someone on his deathbed read him that letter or shared the gospel. I don't know. I wasn't there when he passed. But it grieves me to know that anybody could fall away from the Lord Jesus. Some think that this world is all they have, so they live for the wealth and power and position of this world. You and I must not. Because when you die, can I tell you, you walk out of this world the same way you walked in. Probably without teeth, probably with no hair, and definitely no clothes. Okay, so you, you go just the way you came and you stand before the Lord, spiritually speaking, naked and without excuse. And if Jesus Christ isn't the Lord of your life, what do you say to the living God who will hold you accountable for your sins? The first Christmas is all about the promise of God to deliver us from our sins. Believe in him. If you have a historical, a factual-based reason for not believing in him, share that with me, please. But if you have the IQ of a shoelace, I can prove to you the historicity of this man named Jesus Christ. Now it is yours, not to question his historicity, but either to believe him as the Son of God or not. But understand, there are eternal consequences to whatever decision we make. The decision that he will honor. He gave us a free choice, free will. He wants all men to be saved. Our inheritance as Christians is sure, but it is kept in heaven for us. It is not here on earth. Verse 5, who through faith, we, who through faith are shielded by God's power. Isn't that the coolest promise you ever read? Satan wants to do all manner of evil against you. And God says, no, you ain't messing with my kids. The things that God does allow us to go through must be for our benefit. Doesn't your Bible tell you that all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purposes? So if he allows something in my life, I caught COVID last year, big deal. I'm still here. Got a, 
residual cough, but so does everybody else who had COVID. What do I care? I'll have a voice like, like I don't know, Josh Groban when I get to heaven. So who cares what happens to my voice down here? I care. It matters most to me that Jesus is Lord. Lord, day in, day out. I'm in his word, day in, day out. I want to be in prayer, day in, day out. I don't want to be so busy and caught up in the world's affairs that I forget Jesus died for me. He loves me. It's so easy to get embroiled, especially this time of year. Can I tell you, Christmas is not about crass commercialism. It's about Jesus. It's about all that he did for us, and I don't ever want to forget that, and especially at Christmas time, knowing what is ahead, knowing that I am shielded by God's power, verse 5, because of my faith in him. I'm shielded by his power. Oh, that's glorious. You remember in the Old Testament book of Job, chapters 1 and chapter 2, it says that Satan uh, appeared with the other angels of God before the throne of God one day, and God asked Satan a question. He said, what you doing? What's up? Homie? I don't think he said homie, but he, he did ask him, you know, what's, what's going on? And Satan said, I've been going throughout the whole world strategizing against your people. And then God took the opportunity to brag on one of his children. He said, have you seen my servant Job? Most righteous man on the whole planet loves me, follows me, keeps my word, and has raised his kids like that. God was bragging on his children. Just imagine God doing that with you tonight. Satan, have you seen my kids? They love me, man. They go to church. They could have been playing pinochle with somebody else. I, I, I don't know what your favorite alternative activity is besides going to church on Wednesday night. But, but God says, you see them? They're in my house. They're singing my praise. They're reading my word. They love me with all of their heart. He's bragging on you and I. It's not because we're perfect. It's because we're saved, kept by God's power. It's God's power that raised Jesus from the dead and someday will raise us from the dead. Paul, in light of this fact, in verse 5, we're shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that's ready to be revealed in the last days. Paul would write to the church at Philippi, Greece, and in chapter 1, verse 4, said this, In all of my prayers for you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. In other words, God's never going to give up on you. He will never let go of you. He loves you tremendously. He will carry you through to the very end until it is completed in the day of Christ Jesus. Jude 24 said, Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his, his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. I'm staggered by what he just said without finishing the sentence. To him who is able to keep you from falling. Have you ever wondered that you would turn your back on Jesus Christ? Jude said, Now to him who is able to keep you from falling. He shields us from the worst of the enemy's attacks. Praise his holy name. He holds us in the palm of his hand. Jesus said, herein is the will of the Father that I lose not one of all that he has given me. He, he, he's not willing that any should perish. But I encourage you, do not turn your back on the Lord Jesus Christ. To do so is to forfeit all of these blessings that he's just outlined. Don't let sh Satan rattle your faith. In the midst of struggles and trials, financial setbacks, health issues, and my heart goes out to the people that have to endure such things, many of whom are right here tonight. My heart breaks for you. And if, there, if I had a magic wand that I could wave over you and make everything better, I would do it in a New York minute. But I do not have that power. God does. And if he loves you, and has allowed you to go through the things that we do, it somehow or another serves his ultimate purpose in your life. It'll make you a better person if you allow it to. So don't become bitter when the hard times hit. Allow God to make you better through those things. Just yield to him. He'll see you through. We are shielded by God's power. He continues on in verse 6, says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now a little... For a little while, you may have had to have suffered grief in all kinds of trials. 
<sighs> Just say amen. We've had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials, personal, in our marriages, in our homes, in our workplaces, the, our health issues, the list goes on and on. God knows God sees, and he's a God of all comfort and compassion. Doesn't Paul talk to the Corinthians about, may the God of all comfort comfort you in the comfort that he himself has comforted us with? Paul says, I've received it from God. Receive it from him as well. Let him comfort you in the midst of the struggles that you go through. James, the book that we just left uh, before we got to 1 Peter, said this in chapter 1, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Now, in your flesh, you go, I wish he'd never written that. I wish he had not said that. Consider it pure joy. <clears throat> Do you struggle sometimes with considering it pure joy when you go through the trials of life? I confess to you, sometimes I struggle, mostly because I don't understand. You ever been there? Where you're flat on your back, you're in the hospital, you got X, Y, or Z going on in your life, and you say, I don't understand. I don't understand. It is difficult in that moment to consider it pure joy, my brothers. But because of these promises that we have here, that our inheritance is waiting for us. It's kept in heaven. It is there. Someday all of these struggles and trials, someday they'll be behind us. And we'll enjoy the richest imaginable inheritance. No mind has conceived of, no eye seen, no ear can, has heard the glorious things that God has awaiting for us. That's a glorious promise to me. That makes me happy. So James, in light of those truths, he heard all of the same things I'm sharing with you tonight. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance, can I hang in there as Jesus helps me? Yes. Can I hang in there if I hang on to the promises of God? Yes. Will his Holy Spirit fill me with love and joy and peace and patience as I go through this trial? Yeah. One of my favorite expressions to remind myself of when I go through things I don't understand and hard things, whether it's in, in the home or, or the heart or the workplace, this too shall pass. Write that one down. I didn't copyright it. Feel free to write that down. This too shall pass. The problems in my marriage, this too shall pass. The problems with my health, this too shall pass. The problems with my finances, this too shall pass. Hang on to that precious promise because God loves you. He's going to see you through every trial that you ever face. James continues, perseverance must finish its work so that you may, may be mature and complete. Mature translates the Greek word teleos, which means perfect. God is perfecting your faith. It's not there yet. You struggle with your faith sometimes. I do. You do. We all do. But what is God doing by allowing me to go through these trials? He's teaching me things like perseverance. He's teaching me things like I don't understand this, but my God will see me through it. My God will, is reminding me, this too, Jim, shall pass. Keep your eyes on me, not the sin, the self, or the circumstance. Keep your eyes on me, and everything will be just fine. That's the hope of the church. Paul would write the church at Rome saying, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. That's God's promise to you. There's glory coming that will make this entire world and everything you've ever gone through pale into insignificance. All of your troubles uh, when we stand before his holy throne are going to be the size of a grain of sand on something as large as the sun. Nothing. That's what all of our, our present sufferings, not worth of being compared to the glorious riches that will be revealed in us. What a precious promise that is. These trials, Peter says in verse 7, these have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, you clinging to God is, is, is better than gold being presented to the Lord as an offering in a church service. Your faith is of greater worth than gold, which perishes gold does even though it's refined by fire, that it, your faith may be proved genuine and may result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Because when we see him, you know what he's going to say? Well 
done. Good and faithful servant. Oh, that's the only reward that I really care about. That's all I want to hear. I don't care if I get a paper crown when I get there. But if I hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant, and I get to hug him, I'm good. I'm good. I just want to hug him. I'm not one of those huggy, touchy, feely guys. That's my, my grandchildren. love them with all my heart. I, there's no, no greater joy that I have than to, than to envelop him in my arms. And someday as God envelops us in his arms, I can hear that whispered in, in uh, my ear. Well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. Verse 8, look at this. This blesses God so much. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving, here and now, you are receiving the goal of your faith, which is what? The salvation of your souls. You're receiving that right here, right now in the Greek tense, right here, right now, present tense. It's in the middle voice. You yourself are receiving this glorious truth. And it's a participle. It's continuing an ongoing action. You are here and now continuously continue to receiving the, the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. It'll be perfected someday. Till then, there, there's work to be done, and so we go through the things that we do. In John chapter 20, verse 29, Jesus said something. He said, because you have seen me, you have believed, he told Thomas in one of his post-resurrection appearances. He said, but blessed are those who have not seen me and yet believed. We're more blessed than Thomas, who was one of Jesus' original 12 disciples. You are more blessed than Thomas. He believed because he saw. You'll remember he had said, well, I'm not going to believe that Jesus rose from the dead. I mean, you guys may have saw him. Yeah, whatever. You may have gone to the empty tomb. I wasn't there. You know, he, and he said, I will not believe. See, believing is not a matter of the heart. It's not a matter of the intellect. It's a matter of the will. You choose to believe or not. You choose to submit or not. But Thomas said, I will not believe until I stick my finger in the nail prints in his hand and thrust my hand into the spear wound in his side. A week later, Jesus showed up again in the very same room, only this time Thomas was there. Jesus apparently had been there on the first occasion and overheard every word he said. And I tell you, Jesus is right here tonight and knows every thought you have thought since you walked in this building. And Jesus told Thomas, Thomas, why don't you take your finger and run it through the nail print in my hand? Why don't you take your hand, Thomas, and thrust it into the spear wound in my side? If that's what it'll take for you to believe, go ahead. Thomas fell on his face. And said what? My Lord and God. Jesus didn't correct him. Jesus said, oh, no, 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 I'm not God. I'm, I'm just a guy. No, he is God. Jesus is God. Son of man who came to the earth. Son of man, son of God. Messiah that Israel looked forward to for uh, 1,500 years since the promises first given to Abraham. My Lord and my God, my shepherd. But we're told here by Peter you and I are more blessed because you know what? We didn't have the opportunity to stick our hands in the nail prints in his hand or stick our hand into the spear wound in his side. But you and I have believed we've not seen him, but we believe what these guys said. They wrote it down because they were willing to give their lives for it. We know their testimony to be true. They hung out with Jesus for three and a half years. They saw the miracles, and when Jesus sent them out, they did those miracles. Didn't Jesus say, you'll do greater things than I? So they cast out demons. They raised the dead. They healed the sick. And I'll bet they were going, wow, dude, you believe that? I mean, we're just a couple of fishermen. You, you're a stupid guy, a tax collector. What do you know? And yet you're raising the dead and healing the sick and casting out demons. Wow, do you believe that? That's the power and authority that Christians have in Christ Jesus. He is in us, Christ in you, the hope of glory, the Bible says. That's our hope. That's the hope that we have. And Christmas to me brings all of that remembrance back to mind. He came the first time to empower his church and to enable us to wait for his second coming. He is coming and coming very soon. 
tell you what, as things are developing on the, on the Chinese and Taiwan border, and uh, Taiwan's only 100 miles off the mainland China, you know, with Russia amassing 175,000 troops on the Ukraine border. And understand this, Ukraine and Russia are both nuclear powers. So is China. A congressman two weeks ago said, yeah, well, we, if they invade Taiwan, all options are on the table, including nuclear options. He threatened China with a first strike nuclear capability. We live in days where crazy people are talking. And people are catching them on CNN and other news networks going, dude, you just threatened China with nuclear war? China one time said, in a war, America, we have more people than you have bullets. They're right. They are right. You, we don't want to wind up in a war with anybody. We're already in a war with Satan. We're already in a war with a sinful fallen world. I'm already in a war with my sinful fallen flesh, keeping it under control. I don't need another war out there. But Jesus said, when you begin to see all of these things come to pass, look up because your salvation draws near. Amen. So does what China and Russia and Ukraine and terrorists in the Middle East and Iran trying to get his hands on, does this bother me? Signs of the times, it encourages me. It encourages me. I don't walk in fear. I walk in faith. Amen. You do too. And understand... That's of greater worth in God's sight than pure gold. Then all the gold in Fort Knox is your faith in him. And we've believed in a, one, in a Lord that we haven't seen yet, but is coming soon. And he says in verse 10, concerning, I can do this. Can I, can, would you indulge me to just go from 10 through 12 there? Would you indulge me for just a second? I know it's 7 o'clock and you're thinking, yeah, but my brownies are burning at home. Should have turned your oven off before you left. I mean, that's on you, dude. That's Concerning verse 10, this salvation, the prophets, the Old Testament prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you, they searched intently and with the greatest care trying to find out the time and the circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. People like Isaiah, 750 years before Christ, he wrote of the suffering servant. In fact, there are 48 very specific prophecies about the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ in Isaiah 52 and 53. 48 specific prophecies that were all fulfilled in the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 48 specific prophecies. And you go, well, what's the statistical odds of somebody else being the Messiah besides Jesus? If you just take eight of those 48 prophecies and say, what's the chance of these eight specific prophecies? Like the town he was born in. How many people were born in Bethlehem in the first century? I mean, we're narrowing it down pretty quick as to who the Messiah candidates are. The chances of any person on the planet who ever lived of meeting just eight specific prophecies out of Isaiah there are one times 10 to the 17th power. Is that a big number? That is, an, let me paint you a picture. Imagine the entire state of Texas, two feet deep, in silver dollars, and you send a blind man out there and say, kick around as long as you want to, but you have one chance to pick out the one that's been painted red. You got one chance. That's one times 10 to the 17th power of anybody else being the Messiah except Jesus Christ. That's just eight prophecies. What happens if you increase that to say, oh, 15 prophecies? Well, that's 1 times 10 to the 157th power. And you say, is that a big number? There are not that many atoms in the universe. So you think somebody else is the Messiah? You, you think you want to put your faith in Buddha, Muhammad, Confucius? Do the math. It is a statistic. By the way, if you take a stats class, the definition of impossible is anything in excess of 1 times 10 to the 150th power. Jesus fulfilled not just eight of those prophecies, not just 12 of those. He fulfilled over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament. 300. So is there any chance, statistically, I'm, talking, I'm appealing to your objective mind now, is there any chance of anybody else who has ever been born in the history of the world, is there any chance of them being the Son of God, the Son of Man, the Messiah of the world? No, there is no statistical chance. It is an impossibility by the science of mathematics. So why do, in the world do other people believe 
and things besides Jesus because accepting Jesus requires 100% submission and surrender. These other religious systems just require that you pay your dues. Jesus offers us the gift of eternal life for free. The Old Testament prophets, every single one of them was so looking forward to the first coming of Christ and predicted even his second coming. Verse 12, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you, when they spoke of the things that we have now told you by those that have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. The Old Testament prophecies told you he's coming. We're here to tell you that he came. He came in fulfillment of all of these prophecies. Can I tell you, science is on our side. Mathematics is on our side. Thermodynamics is on our side. Astrophysics is on our side. Astronomy is on our side. Geology is on our side. Every branch of science that I have ever touched upon points to Jesus Christ. All of the terminal ends of these sciences leave doctorate level people going, oh, oh, oh. They don't have the answers. The world doesn't have the answers. Only Jesus Christ does. And he wants you to know that even, look at that last verse there, verse 12, the second half, even angels long to look into these things. Angels are curious. You see, the unfallen angels, they've never sinned. So they don't know. They've always lived in the presence of the eternal God. They've never known what alienation from God was like. Well, you and I have experienced it. We understand it. They're going, boy, I don't get it. Why in the world, in view of God's grace, love, and mercy, why would anybody on that stupid little insignificant planet called Earth reject the living God? That, they're dummies. You know, even angels long to look into these things. Angels were present at the first coming of Jesus Christ. Matthew 24 tells us that angels will be present at the second coming of Jesus Christ. There will be the shout of an archangel, the trumpet call of God. Oh, it's going to be glorious. And we'll be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air and so be with the Lord forever. Amen. When I think about that, can I tell you, my cough doesn't matter anymore. My lack of being a billionaire won't matter anymore. Stuff don't matter anymore. The issues of life that I... We, that preoccupy our hearts and minds, these things don't matter anymore. It's all about Jesus. Amen. Keep that in the forefront of your heart and mind this week as we, as we, and, and next week as we lead up to Christmas. Remember, he came into this world as the light of the world. He was born at night into the darkest of times politically to show us the way. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. Nobody comes under the Father except through me, which leaves Buddha out, leaves Muhammad out, leaves Confucius out, leaves all of the Hindu deities out. Jesus said, I'm it. I am the way. A singular and unique, unique identity is always indicated by the inclusion of the definite article in the Greek language, the way. Not just one among many. The way, the truth, the life. There is no other. Statistically, historically, biblically, ecumenically, salvolatingly, whatever.